it really comes down to sort of the fundamentals and the basics of business. And I think that we can really connect with human beings as opposed to trying to like blast our messages everywhere. And I think that's kind of been a really good reframe for us too, is like kind of going back to our roots of connecting with people. So since, since we haven't been doing as much Facebook stuff, we've had, you know, more people talking about us in their blogs, or we've been able to reach out to people who do reviews, or we've, we've kind of freed ourselves up a little bit to connect with other business owners and other people in that way. Have you thought about leaving Facebook? Or what would happen if you pulled your advertising and ditched the Facebook pixel? How are you getting feedback about whether or not your marketing efforts are worth it? I'm Susan Bowles, and you're listening to Break the Ceiling, the show where we break down unconventional strategies you can use to save time, boost your profit, and increase your operational capacity. All this month, I've been talking about digital privacy and online security, and sharing how I researched and implemented a privacy-first marketing strategy for my business. I talked to Paul Jarvis, one of the founders of Fathom Analytics, a privacy-focused alternative to Google Analytics. I spoke with Jessica Robinson, an expert in cybersecurity, about how to assess your business's online security and how to mitigate some of the risks involved. And last week, I talked to Kim Harrington about how focusing on SEO became a big part of my marketing effort as they moved my marketing strategy to be more focused on respect for individual data privacy. So if you missed those episodes, I recommend you go give them a listen because they include a lot of background on this whole experiment and how it came about. This week, I wanted to talk about social media because social media platforms are some of the biggest offenders when it comes to data privacy issues. They track us, every move we make, what we say near our phones, where we go while we have them, all of it. I've considered leaving social media platforms altogether, although I haven't taken that step yet. But social media has never been a focus of any of my marketing or outreach because, honestly, outside of Twitter, I just don't like being on social media much. And I was very skeptical about how effective social media was in getting me actual paying clients. But when it came to my privacy-focused experiment, there wasn't much for me to do other than pull the plug on social media platforms completely. I'm not very active on any platform besides Twitter, which I mostly use to build relationships with primarily peers and other business friends, not so much as a lead gathering system. I did commit to not buying ads on Facebook or Instagram, but since I hadn't been doing that before, there wasn't much of a change. I also committed to not using the Facebook tracking pixel. But again, since I hadn't been using it before, there wasn't anything to remove or to change there either. But these are major marketing channels for lots of small businesses, and it's an important part of the decision-making process if you're thinking about your own marketing from a perspective of privacy. So I wanted to bring on someone who did go through this evaluation process and implemented their own experiment. Meet Natalie Lucier. Natalie has been making websites since she was 12 years old, so she's been living in the online world for quite a while. She's the founder of Access Ally, which is a digital course and membership solution. And about a year ago, she took the Facebook tracking pixel off her website and then left Instagram as a platform, both for her business and personally. Natalie and I talked about how she made the decision to drop the pixel and to leave Instagram. We talk about what she does instead now, and we talk about how to get real actionable data while still being respectful of people's privacy and holding true to her desire not to support Facebook as a company. And stick around after the interview because I'm going to talk about the projects and ideas that I'm still working on implementing for ScaleSpark when it comes to digital privacy. Hey, Natalie, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me, Susan. So you did something, I think, pretty bold for most folks, and you decided to remove the Facebook tracking pixel from all of your websites. So can you Take me through kind of the decision process that led up to that and how you went about actually doing it. 
Yes. So I think all of us are kind of aware of what's going on with social media and particularly Facebook and all the data that they're collecting about us, how they use it against us. And as a marketer, you know, I always thought, oh, well, you know, we we're using it for our business. So and we're a good business <laughs> in my mind. Mm -hmm. Right. We're trying to help people solve a problem. We're helping them to build a membership site and find the right software for that. But then you know, after seeing all the news coming out and just like learning more and more about the algorithms, I was like, you know what? It doesn't feel right. I don't like it when they do it to me, when other businesses do it to me. Um, I don't like how politically it was being used either. And I was like, you know what? I'm contributing to this problem. So why don't, why don't I do something about it? Right. I know I'm just one business and there's tons of people who use Facebook advertising and have tracking pixels on their sites. It might not make a big difference, but you know, a drop in the water is a drop in the water. So I decided, okay, let's go ahead and see what I can do. And I know that tracking and, you know, having collecting data from website visitors is a big part of the Facebook um, data gathering that they do. So I was like, okay, let's just take off the pixel. And also at the same time, we decided to just stop advertising on Facebook uh, just because that's also voting with our money. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a pretty big decision, but it also was kind of going back to our roots because when I started off in business, Facebook existed, but it wasn't a huge part of how we got business. You know, we did have a lot more organic search engine um you know, people coming in through these search engines. And that was just a very organic, natural way of, of growing our business. So we were like, okay, let's just go back to those roots to content marketing and doing some of those things that work really well for us in the past, instead of relying on giving money to this massive organization that has way too much power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when you kind of decided to take this step, were you freaked out? I mean, for a lot of people, this is, you know, it could potentially have a big impact on your revenue, on the, you know, sustainability of your business. You could be cutting off a lead source. And I think a lot of people, when they think about taking the step to stop advertising on Facebook or to stop retargeting people, you know, they that is one of the fears. Did that come up for you? Or um, how, how did that kind of end up happening? Yeah, it's it's totally a valid question. And um, one of the things that we thought about it, you know, we were investing money into Facebook ads. And what we did was we put that budget towards organic SEO. So we hired uh, an, an expert in SEO, we kind of redid a bunch of stuff on our site. And so in a way, it felt like we were just shifting our budget from one platform to another. And instead of investing our money on Facebook, we were investing it in our own property essentially like our own website mm -hmm. so in that way that was a big kind of shift and we talked about it as a team there was definitely you know a debate on our team as whether we should do it or not and um and sometimes we still think about like oh should we try to retarget again like is that something we should explore again um but i just feel like if we're doing things right which i think we are which is you know get people to your website whether that is through social media because you're posting still organic stuff or through a search engine or through a podcast interview or you know whatever it is that people find you from and then get them on your email list which is something i've always always talked about and our 30-day list building challenge um, focuses on a lot then you can just send them an email and i realize you know <laughs> retargeting <laughs> is reaching people in a different platform that they may uh, have forgotten about you they could still unsubscribe from your emails like there's a lot of ways that um you know email may or may not work but again it's something that you have a lot more control over and i think it's it's just a better way of marketing in my opinion um especially just with all of the the things we know about how social media works and how it's used against us in a lot of ways and how it influences us and not necessarily in a positive way uh so so you know how people are, are getting a little bit more depressed and like comparing themselves to other people like all of those things are things i didn't want to contribute to um, and then also, you know, data wise, we were spending a certain amount of money on Facebook, um, but we weren't seeing that many sales. Like I know it's hard sometimes to attribute, like people may click on an ad, they might not buy right away. Maybe they opt in, maybe they buy later. And because of our software, the way it's set up, um, it is a longer time frame for people to sign up. It's not like they sign up as soon as they click. So for us, you know, we, we saw less traffic to our website. That was an obvious Thing that we could track, but we didn't see a huge drop in sales, to be honest. And mm. um, that was also 
affirming, right? So if we would have seen like a huge drop in sales, we would have been like, okay, yeah, like maybe we have to go back. But um, it was really not a huge, huge part of our strategy either. It was something that we were you know, focused on and, and doing ongoing, but shifting that investment that we were doing on Facebook to our own content. Um, now we've more than made up for essentially the loss in traffic and sales are still coming. So yeah, I think it's totally doable to do it the organic way. It's a little bit slower because it's not, you can turn on the switch, start getting traffic <laughs> and turn it off. Um, but once you get it going, I think it's, it's just a better long-term way of growing a business personally. You mentioned kind of tracking data and trying to attribute sales and paying attention to whether or not you had an actual drop in sales. And I think for me, I am a data person. I always want to have data. And, you know, the idea of removing something that theoretically is giving you a source of data can feel really uncomfortable. And, you know, wondering how you get that that feedback loop about whether or not what you're doing is actually benefiting your business. Um, and so can you talk to me a little bit about how your how you approached tracking and continuing to have data about whether or not you were what you were doing was working? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things that we still have on our website, and I am considering whether we want to keep it or not, is we still have Google Analytics and Google Tracking and Google Tag Manager and all of that. Um, and there are alternatives that are more privacy focused. Like I know Fathom. Fathom yeah, so the, yes. the first episode of the same, uh, we actually talked to um, Paul Jarvis. Yes, so exactly. So I know there's Adam, so. Paul is, is doing great work there. Um, and so, you know, there are alternatives to Google Analytics as well. And that's something that we're just kind of starting to explore. Um, but we do still have data from our website. And one of the things, too, that we're really exploring this year is analytical kind of quantitative data versus qualitative data. And that's something that we're doing more with focus groups that we're doing with user testing on our website, user testing with our software. And that is when you're essentially asking people questions and then they're answering you as opposed to just seeing how many people land on a page, how many people click somewhere and how much time they spend, whether they bounce or not. Like all of that is still definitely useful and you need that kind of quantitative data. But the qualitative data is going to give you so much more information into like what's actually Actually working on your website, what's actually getting people to say yes or no. And that's something that we're investing more heavily this year on. And um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. I feel like that's already given us a lot to, to chew on and to make updates for. Tell me a little bit more about um, kind of what resources are you using? Are you going directly to, are you using customers? Are you talking to prospective clients? How are you getting um, some of that more qualitative data about how people are either using the software or using the website? Uh, many, many places. So <laughs> one of the things we've started doing is uh, after people opt in or purchase, we have a quick survey that asks them, you know, what led them to take that action essentially. So we kind of have a bit more of an idea of the people who are taking action. What is it that drove them to do that? Um, so that's like one quick place that we've we've made a change to get that qualitative data directly from you know people who are who are actually interacting who with actually our site bought it. who actually yeah. did things yeah <laughs> exactly um, and then the other thing um, we're doing focus groups so we're inviting customers and also people who did not purchase um, and doing focus groups and asking them like actual questions, you know, like, how did you feel when you got here? Do you understand what the product is? What's difficult to use? Like all of these kinds of questions, what made you, uh, you know, want to click and find out more? What else were you researching? All of that kind of questions are, are coming up. And then um, we're also using usertesting.com, which uh, is a little bit of a pricey way to go. Um, there are, uh, there's also winter, W-Y-N-T-E-R.com, which we're, we're exploring as well. Um, and there's, I think, usability hub. So there's, there's a couple of different ways that you can test uh, and ask people questions. So basically you can set up a test and have like 
strangers <laughs> who don't know your product <laughs> come up and give you feedback and just talk through like what they thought when they were reading this page or, um, you know, what they thought was confusing about the onboarding of your product or whatever it is. So for us, uh, that's a worthwhile inv investment to actually get people who maybe don't know us yet. Cause I feel like there is some bias that comes in when they're already a customer or, you know, they heard about us from a friend or whatnot. So that's a big part of it. And then finally we do, uh, demo calls. So that's something that we offer for free for anyone who's curious about Access Ally is they can come on a call with us. We, you know, show them the product, but then we also can ask them some questions while they're there. Right. So that gives us a lot of data to go on as well. And, you know, it's directly from a person. We can dig a little deeper if we see like, oh, you know, they were really confused about this or, um, this really sparked their interest. So can we talk more about that in our, on our website or whatnot? So, um, a lot of different places. And then we're just trying to really collect all of that to help us make better decisions as well. Uh, I love this idea because I think oftentimes we fall into this trap that the data that we're provided is somehow useful. Um, and I, I think that's not always the case. You know, when you were talking about, you know, how much website traffic you're getting. Yeah, that's nice. Um, but you also don't know what people were looking for. And maybe they hit your website and it wasn't what they were expecting and it really has nothing to do with you or your product. Um, and so I love this idea of looking for other sources of real actionable data in something as simple as a survey when people do something, asking them why they did it, you know, is simple and I think oftentimes overlooked as a really valuable source of data. I do, I do the same thing, you know, podcasts and uh, a lot of the marketing that I do, I'm not I'm intentionally not tracking people, which makes it really right. hard to figure out, you know, how people find me. Uh, and the easiest way is to say, hey, how, how did you find me? <laughs> and so that's on all of my forums is, you know, how'd you find out about this? How did you, how'd you hear about it? Um, and something as simple as just asking, sometimes we forget that that can be a really powerful source of data. Absolutely. And same goes for, you know, any forums that you're a part of, you can just kind of ask people questions there, or, um, you know, there might be other places that the types of people who would be ideal for your work are, uh, you know, where they're already congregating. So like there's, there's places off of Facebook now <laughs> where mm -hmm. we can do some of these things. <laughs> um, and unfortunately we still have a Facebook group for our business. So we're not hundred percent off Facebook, but that is also on our radar for, you know, shifting that eventually too. Interesting. Hey there, it's Susan. If you've been listening to this interview and it's making you think about some of these issues and ideas, and you wish you could talk to some other real live business owners about it, I wanted to invite you to my free monthly roundtable, Dollars and Decisions. Once a month, I get together live with a group of amazing business owners just like you to geek out on money and operations and workflow and software, all that stuff that you hear me talk about here. The Roundtable is kind of like a live interactive version of the podcast, so I would love to have you join me. To sign up for the next Roundtable, head to scalespark.co slash dollars and decisions, no spaces, no hyphens, or you can just click the link in the show notes. Hope to see you there. So along the lines with all of this happening in your business and removing the pixel and thinking about different ways of collecting data, you also actually deleted your personal and your business Instagram accounts. So can you tell me about that decision? What drove it? How does it feel? It's, it feels freeing to be honest. So <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and yeah, so the decision behind that was kind of similar to the Facebook pixel decision. It was like a couple months later after afterwards, but I think a lot of it was, you know, I haven't, I hadn't really been using it a ton, kind of similar to Facebook. Like I don't think our business was really benefiting from the work that we were doing in terms of posting on Instagram. So it, you know, data or no data, like that one was what a pretty easy decision because it just like the way that our product is, it doesn't make sense to be just posting pretty pictures and being like, okay, you know, now that I've motivated you about online courses and memberships, click through and buy my software. I just didn't quite <laughs> connect for, for the audience. 
Um, and I'm sure there's ways to do it well, but just the way that, that we operate, it didn't quite make sense. Um, but yeah, in terms of why I did it, it was, um, especially for me, Instagram has like this level of like perfection and posing and just kind of, you know, making everything like pixel perfect. And it was just like such a high bar. Um, and I, you know, I have two young children running this, you know, successful business. We have 10 team members, we have a farm now, we have a lot going on. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? Um, and you know, it, there was just no reason to be putting my energy into it. And also when I scroll on Instagram, I know that I don't always feel good. Uh, because I'm like, Oh, like that's something I should be doing or, Oh, I haven't, you know, like it just really brings up my own, um, sort of competitive or, you know, comparison side of things. And it's just, it zaps my energy. So it was a pretty easy decision. And there was definitely a part of me that was like, Oh my God, like once you do this, like, that's it. Like there's no going back. And obviously I could start another account, but, um, I was like, okay, yeah, this is kind of final, but I just, I just felt like it was the right decision. Um, and I've definitely not regretted it. I'm like, oh my God, I have like my phone and no longer has this weird, like push pull energy around it. And that, that has been really great. Mm, I love that. So talk to me a little bit about kind of the impact you've seen on your business since you took these steps. You talked a little bit about not seeing much of a drop in sales, but have you noticed um, other impacts, financial or operational or just kind of energetically? Yeah. So uh, like things last year was a bit of a weird year because obviously COVID mm, hit. 2020. And then, <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, we had a spike in sales and that was pure, just organic people looking to do online courses. Um, and so, yeah, so I would say like sales were not affected negatively by not doing it. And I don't know if things would have been different if we were still doing it. But anyways, it's fine. Uh, so, so that would be that would be one way to look at at the data in terms of sales. But um, other than that, yeah, I would say we really freed up a lot of energy internally on the team and time spent, um, you know, creating new ads, testing ads, retargeting ads, like all of that. And um, and we had like folders of images and, you know, OK, time to create new new images, time to create new copy and update copy. And OK, let's do videos now. Let's do things. So I feel like we've really freed up a lot of our team's time. And like I said, what we ended up doing is using all of that energy to create better content and to work on our website and making sure that it has good resources for people when they do land on it. So we've been able to publish. Oh, man, I don't remember the exact number, but probably like 20 or 30 new pages on our site. Oh, wow. that would never have happened if we were still focusing on someone else's platform, like putting things on Facebook. And you're finding that those that those pieces of content are driving traffic and that they're, you know, wor were they worth the investment of your time, I guess? Yes, they are. And we're just seeing those increase over like over time more and more as they've had a little bit more time to kind of rank in the search engines. But yeah, it's like thousands of, subs of not subscribers, thousands of traffic of, of people coming to our website um, month over month because of those new pages. Mm, I love that. I, it, it's a really efficient investment of time that can pay off exponentially the longer it exists uh, versus social media that is so um, time dependent. And if somebody doesn't, if somebody blinks, it's not in their feed anymore. Absolutely. And I do feel, feel like it's more of a long-term investment because it does take time to create, but once it's on your site, assuming it's sort of evergreen content, then it will only continue to get new people every month or every week. Right. So mm -hmm. to me, it's like, there's no future investment. <laughs> like, yes, we may need to update it if it gets out of date, but, um, it's a, it's a huge, a huge asset, I would say. Mm, I love that. So is there anything you think we should talk about or touch on here that we haven't talked about yet? Um, yeah, so I feel like uh, if people are trying to make a decision on on this kind of stuff, you know, for me, it really comes down to sort of the fundamentals and the basics of business. And I think that we can really connect with human beings as opposed to trying to like blast our messages everywhere. And I think that's kind of been, um, a really good reframe for us too, is like kind of going back to our roots of connecting with people. So since, since we haven't been doing as much Facebook stuff, we've had, uh, you know, more people 
talking about us in their blogs, or we've been able to reach out to people who do reviews, or we've, we've kind of freed ourselves up a little bit to connect with other business owners and other people in that way. Um, and I think that's also something that doesn't usually like go top of mind when you think about, okay, I'm going to take this time away from ads and I can actually invest it in relationships too. Yeah. I think especially with kind of your style business, you know, a, a software business, that's not how most people think about that you quote unquote should be marketing because you know, your, your volume matters and thinking about building relationships, I think is a little bit unusual, but I really love that perspective because even it doesn't have to be not scalable. You can still build real genuine relationships with people um, at scale in this way. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing that we have is a certification program for people who want to learn our software and use it with their clients. And so we've been able to, you know, find people that we think would be great as certified experts and kind of train them up on the software. And then they can kind of go out and spread the good word essentially on, on Access <laughs> Ally. And that has also made it a huge difference. So it's kind of like we are, and I don't think they're spending ads, <laughs> you know, they're using ads to send people our way. Um, I think it's just through people's networks, right? And I think that um, remembering social networks was really used, it used to be about the network, right? And mm -hmm. now it's kind of about the data. Um, and so, yeah, just going back to the network part of it, I think is, is a really good idea too. Oh, I love that. So where can our listeners find you if they want to connect or learn more about what you do? Yeah, so accessally.com is our main website, our company website, and that's, uh, I'm sure there'll be a link in there, yep. but also <laughs> if someone is curious about list building and kind of focusing more on organic ways to grow an email list, we have a free 30-day list building challenge, um, and you can just go and sign up for that at 30daylistbuildingchallenge.com, 3030, and um, it's totally free. You get one video a day for 30 days, and it walks you through all kinds of different ways of getting people to your website and improving the opt-ins on your website to get more of the right people. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming and uh, geeking out with me here on uh, privacy-focused marketing. Yes, of course. Thank you. This was so much fun. <laughs> for Natalie, the decision about dropping the pixel and leaving Instagram was one that was very closely tied to her values and the desire to vote with her wallet and not support companies that she felt violated ethical boundaries. It also happened to have the benefit of reducing the amount of data that she provided to companies like Facebook and that she tracked in her own business. And that had pretty much no negative impact on her business. In fact, it allowed her to focus on more effective marketing channels like SEO. For me, this initiative to build safety and security into the DNA of my business is really just beginning. Building a marketing system that was respectful of individual privacy and focused on ensuring the security of any data I might handle, that was just the start. I still have a lot of work to do in this and in other areas of my business, but the point of having core values is to give you something to consistently be working towards. So from a data privacy perspective, some of the initiatives I'm still thinking about how to implement are using a more privacy focused email platform like Fastmail or Hey, which is a newish privacy focused email from the Basecamp founders. I did switch to Hey for my personal email, but I haven't made the switch yet for the work email. ScaleSparks email is still hosted on Gmail primarily because of the integration with Google Calendar and that Google Calendar integrates with so many other tools. I haven't found a good privacy focused email platform that has a great calendar with integrations to a scheduling platform like Calendly. So this is on the list to implement eventually, but it might be a while. And if you happen to know of a great solution, reach out and let me know. Another area is removing tracking from my email list. So I use ConvertKit, which I really like because of the automations and the integrations to other platforms like my course platform. But as far as I know, I can't turn off tracking. So I still have data on opens, clicks, etc. I don't look at the data much, but it's still there. And that's still an area that needs to be tackled. But again, the technology doesn't really seem to be there yet. And also, it's not really a priority for most email marketing platforms. The industry is pushing for more tracking and personalization, not less for the most part. And I'm still trying to decide how I feel about using social media. I haven't deleted any of my profiles, although I functionally left Facebook about two years ago, both personally and professionally. I don't post on it. I don't open it. 
The only platform I'm actually active on is Twitter, and I have gotten a few clients from that platform and a few from LinkedIn. I've never gotten a client from Instagram or Facebook, so the decision about whether or not to completely leave the social media platforms versus just not being active on them, that's still up in the air. So there's still more work to do, and the digital world is changing as rapidly as ever, so there will always be more work to do. How about you? Are you thinking about starting some digital privacy experiments of your own? Hit me up on Twitter at the Susan Bowles and tell me what you're doing or what you're thinking about. Break the Ceiling is produced by Yellow House Media. Our executive producer is Sean McMullen. Our production coordinator is Lou Blazer. This episode was edited by Marty Seafeld with production assistance by Kristen Runbeck.